Hey guys, welcome to today's episode and we have Dr. Crystal here for part two. If you didn't listen to last week's episode, make sure you listen to part one. We are talking about how to heal your gut, how to get rid of the bloat, and how to get rid of parasites and so much more. And we're also talking about the infamous coffee enema. So join us now as we um, have Dr. Crystal on. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we were right in the middle of talking about the coffee enema. Let's just do a little bit of a recap first before we dive right in. Just talk to people a little bit of kind of what got you so passionate about getting into gut health, and then we'll dive right back into the coffee enema. Okay, so yeah, I'll go a little quicker because the last episode we went to detail, but basically what got me into gut health was just my my own experience with um, the medical community, diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome, joint pain, given medications, in and out of doctor's offices, I had surgery on my knees because they were completely degraded. The cartilage was degraded. Uh, I remember a a doctor coming in and walked out and then walked back in and I went, my apologies. I walked out because I thought I was in the wrong room. I thought I was looking at a 70-year-old knee here. What's going on? So the amount of inflammation that I've experienced throughout my life and always being bloated and looking six months pregnant. Uh, and just never getting any answers. And uh, so that just led me to naturopathic medicine and then eventually coffee enemas because uh, of an incident with anxiety and depression. And when I did a coffee enema, um, it just seemed to disappear. I released some uh, tapeworms and a bunch of other things. And all of a sudden, I just felt incredible. I had never felt like that in my life. It wasn't like going back to normal it was as if I never knew what normal was. I never knew what it was like to have no brain fog and actually have energy. You know, we get so used to living with what we have. And then when somebody gives us a new way, you're shocked that you never lived this way in the first place. So that's sort of of how I fell into coffee and MIs. It sort of fell on my lap literally by accident. And uh, I haven't looked back since. And I really feel that a lot of people could benefit from them. So we had a guest before, and he talked about how he believed that 80% of our population is inflamed with parasites, and they have major parasites. They don't know it. And I really believe that's true. I believe that 70 to 80% of people do have parasites, and they don't think it because maybe it's not affecting them. You know, some people it's affecting more than, than others. But what would you say, like, if you had to say, like, if I had to guess, what would you say is the number of people or percentage of people that really are dealing with parasites right now? Oh gosh, I, I can't even I can't even say like can I say a hundred percent? I know, right? <laughs> That's that. I agree. I think it's probably true. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's hard for me because I'm seeing people that are sick. I'm seeing people that have tried everything. I'm and as you mentioned, it's not the reason why we're missing this is because. W- like myself, we're dealing with it. We're healthy. We're fine. We're fine until we're not fine. And then the disease we're diagnosed with, at that point, our body's so far gone, you're not thinking parasites. You're just thinking managing this disease. And so we never ever think about how we got to this place. It's not like I got a parasite today and I'm going to get sick tomorrow. It's you could have gotten this 10 years ago. And parasites aren't all deadly. It really just depends on what else is happening in your body, add in stress, add in genetic factors, add in what you're eating, you know, it becomes a perfect storm. And so that's why we miss them. And then we also miss them because they're really stealthy. They don't come out in stool tests like they should. We're relying on this method. Doctors think that this these stool tests are these gold standards. And if it's negative, we trust the stool test. But there's so many people that, like myself, we do these stool tests, they come back negative. And then you look in the toilet and you're like, this can't be normal. You know, people will argue that what you see in the toilet is not a parasite. It could be intestinal tissue and, you know, it's food that you didn't digest and mucus. And nonetheless, this isn't normal. It shouldn't be coming out that way. And I know that for a fact, because in my clinical experience, I don't see the same stuff in all the different and all the enemas. It's not like every single person comes back with liver flukes, tapeworm, rope worms, mucus, phlegm, gallstones, a parasite eggs. Like everybody's different. 
And it's rare that I see a person that has tons of worms come out, um, but it's not uncommon. But I, I see it. I see it often enough. But in comparison to, you know, if somebody says, what are the chances of me seeing a worm? Mm, I'm not sure. Like, it's not that common. But I do see a lot of liver flukes. I do see a lot of stones. I do see a lot of little uh, undigested food that gives us an idea of how our stomach and gallbladder is doing with regards to poor digestion. We get a lot of information out of it. So regardless of the research that is telling us that these aren't parasites and that these enemas are dangerous, at the end of the day, we need to try things and we need to create our own evidence. We need to create our own opinion on a technique as long as we're doing it safely, we're being monitored, and we're not doing things irresponsibly, then there's really nothing stopping us from trying an enema for ourselves and just seeing how we feel. Well, I will tell you, I I know for a fact that I have liver flukes and I know that I did, I just did a coffee enema and then I also did a colonic. I went to the Edgar Casey, I did a colonic. And then after that, you know, I'm always looking at my poop. I'm like always looking. And then I went in, I wish I would have taken a picture of it. And I pulled out, I think it was about like probably about five, five or six inches of a tapeworm. And I looked it up and I know I have liver flukes for sure. And the sad part is I've done so many different parasite cleanses. And so like for me, out of anyone who's done so many parasite cleanses, I've done all the different things. And for me to still find a tapeworm and for me to still have liver flukes, it's kind of like, what in the world? Yeah, that's because we're always bombarded by them. It's not like you eliminate one and then you're done. Um, It's also with repairing the body to make our bodies resilient from getting a parasite to invade us. So it's not like we can avoid them completely. Yes, we can avoid raw sushi. Yes, we can have raw fish. Yes, we can avoid raw meat. Yes, we can make sure we clean our, our vegetables and fruit. We can definitely do some things, but we can't completely avoid them. So what we need to do is we need to make sure our bodies are set up so that when we are exposed to them, our stomach acid is high enough so that that is the first place that kills off these parasites. We have to make sure our bile acid is flowing. So again, we can remove and eliminate them. But when that's compromised, now you're literally like a sitting pool of parasites that are coming in and bacteria because it's building up because your detox pathways and your stomach acid is not eliminating them properly. So then they accumulate. So that's probably what might have happened. Yeah. And I'm getting ready to, you guys, I'm getting, this is my favorite digestive enzyme that I take. Um, it's called Massimes by Bio Optimizers. I'll put the link in the thing. And I just finished eating lunch. I'm getting ready to take some right now um, because I realized I didn't take any. But I think, like you said, I know my stomach acid is terrible because when I gave birth to my son, I, well, first of all, I was bulimic at the age of about 20 to about 23. So for three years while I was going through college, I was so stressed out for my last two to three years of college that I just threw up every day because I was a math major. And I got to the place where I was like, this is just beyond me. And I was just, I don't know, I just would eat donuts and (laughs) and throw them up. (laughs) So I did that when I was going through college. And then when I was pregnant with my son, I truly was so sick. I threw up a minimum of six times every single day. I barely, I only gained like 22 pounds maybe um, when I was pregnant, if that, because I literally threw up every single day, six times a day at a minimum. So my stomach acid already is not good. So I have to be taking digestive enzymes. So let's hear a day in the life of you. Like, you really are the epitome of health. And so try to be as detailed as possible. Like what are some of the things that you do? Like give us a typical meal that you love to eat and some things that you go, I'm not going to do this. Like like if you say, I'm not going to eat grains or I'm not going to eat gluten, that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, it's the first and foremost, sleep is probably the most important. Um, and, it, you know, and it's about not just quantity, but the quality of my sleep. And so I'm really making sure I'm not a coffee drinker per se. If I'm socially 
I'm around, I'm being social and there's people drinking coffee. I might, I might have one, but I'm not a coffee drinker. Uh, genetically, I just don't think I have the genes for it. It doesn't metabolize well in my body. Um, I've always been sensitive to things. So I'm, I'm, I always make sure I'm not doing anything too stimulating before sleep. So my quality of sleep is important. And I wake up and the first thing I do is I pray. Uh, and then once I'm done that and I have my alone time, if the kids are going to wake up soon, I have a three and a six-year-old, then I'm right away downstairs making breakfast because they get pretty hangry. <laughs> so the breakfast comes first. Everybody gets fed. I don't eat, actually. I will do a little bit of intermittent fasting when I can. Uh, again, I don't I don't really have a regimented place that I a place that I follow. I really just follow my body. So that day, if I'm running around, I don't get a hunger cue. I'm serving everybody else. I don't eat. And then when I have that moment, then I feel the hunger cue, then I eat. So I really listen to that. Um, and then lately, um, I've actually been- Okay. Saying, yeah. I want yeah, to- I know we're- that. Different. Yes. <laughs> no, that, that's so, so important because I want to just stop right there because it just made me think of a question that someone asked and it was just, just so, so good. It's from um, Joanne from the UK. Uh, I want to read this question because she said, not sure if I've been asked if you've been asked this before, but I start just started listening to your podcast. The best advice I'd ever heard and pretty pretty common sense too is to don't eat until your stomach is growling at you. Thank you. Anyway, my question is related to menopause. Since coming into menopause, I've gone up three dress sizes. I'm really struggling to say no to food. I can do not I can do no eating until my stomach's growling for half of the day, but I find myself just eating out of habit. I'm really struggling mentally at this minute to keep saying to myself, let it slide as you don't need the extra pressure. Three dress sizes increase later and enough is enough. So my question is, how do I break the habit without putting too much pressure on myself? Even when I am eating, I will say to myself, why are you eating this? You're not hungry. And I will just say, oh, well, and carry on. I'm desperate to change my habit. So Aww. this is Joanne from the UK. But so just talk a little bit about why, like how you can, you know, talk yourself into going, okay, I'm not physically hungry right now. I'm going to wait till my stomach growls and then I'm going to wait and eat. Can you talk about that a little bit more? I can, except I have another way of thinking about it. So just to answer that quickly, what I've done for myself in the past, it's kind of silly, and for patients too, is sometimes when we're hungry, uh, I look at it as if it's a third party who's hungry. It's not actually me, i.e. the gut bugs. And I will talk to them and say, no, we're not feeding you today. We're feeding me today. And I'm not going to eat that because I care about myself more than I care about you. And I pick me today. So I've, I've used that with patients before where we know they actually have a dysbiosis of some sort, whether they're SIBO or parasites, and trying to like push, put that on to them and to gain control back of your body, because that's how I see parasites. I see them as hijacking your body. So I've used that trick before. And I've used the water trick before. That seems to work well for me, where the second I feel hungry, I'll drink tea, I'll drink water. And if I'm still hungry, hungry 20 minutes later, then yes, I'll, I'll grab something to eat. But at least it gives me that time to really think about it. But what I wanted to say is, I just really want to caution people to look at it as if something's wrong with them and they don't have willpower and they just, they can't, fit food controls them. I really want to put it back on those, those microbes because they really are controlling your cravings. They're really like depleting you of your nutrients. And so you may have just eaten a meal a satisfactory meal, and then you might be hungry again. And that's not necessarily because there's something wrong with you and the way you think. It's because they ate it. They pulled your nutrients. They pulled your iron. They took it all from you. And so then your body's going, where's that iron? Where's that vitamin D? I need food. And then you're hungry again. So sometimes it's most of the time it's physiological when we're not feeling like we're in control. Like we just, we, we know better. We've read it, but we just can't control it. Mm, so good. That is just straight wisdom right there. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, so keep going. I just, when you said that, I'm like, oh my yeah, gosh, I'm good. Yeah. To ask this question if I don't. Mm. So let's hear more about the rest of a day in the life of you. Sure. Um, yeah. So lately I had been dabbling in, uh, dabbling with diatomaceous earth. So uh, it's just a whole other 
topic in itself. It's so interesting. But uh, just as an anti-parasitic, uh, I just come come back from Costa Rica. We were living there for a little while and we got some parasites. And actually, my stool test did come back positive, which sh- shocked me because they've never come back positive. So I did actually come back with some parasites. Um, so I have been working recently on on that and diatomaceous earth. I wanted to try and it's been really going well. I've been giving it to my dog and he stopped shedding, literally stopped shedding. He's this massive lab. He sheds all this time. After about a month of diatomaceous earth, he stopped shedding. And my little baby here that had been struggling to grow started to grow as well. Um, so I've been loving my diatomaceous earth. And then I also sometimes how dabble with it. Just like explore water. How do they? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's just, it has to be food grade. So there's your, gar- your garden diatomaceous earth and then there's the food grade. So it has to be food grade. And then I just take a teaspoon. I started off with a half teaspoon, but now I take a teaspoon. I mix it in water and I drink it right away. I take it on an empty stomach and you drink it right away because it's, it's like a clay. Like you have to drink it before I set them in. And that's it. And the problem is all of the containers like on Amazon, it's like they're like five pound bags, like, right? Like they're- Oh, yeah, not the one I get. Of... I'll share you the one I get. Okay, yeah, you'll yeah. have to share it with me. Yeah, yeah. And you have to be careful because when you open it, where the danger comes in is the aerosolized diatomaceous earth. You don't want to breathe it in. So the first time I opened the bag, I just wore a mask and I put my face away because it's just that first time you open it. And then after that, just be cautious when you open it. So you're just doing one teaspoon in like some warm water. And you can do more. But yeah, I was just doing one teaspoon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what well, so were some that. of the benefits you felt from that? You felt like it was getting rid of some of the parasites with that? Well, it was, yeah, uh, the physical, the real obvious signs were that my hair was starting to grow back um, just from postpartum. Uh, I, I, like I said, I sat on my dog. Um, I started to notice it in my skin. I started to just notice a bit more of a glow. Um, yeah. And, and otherwise, other than that, I mean, I was doing so much other things that I, I can't say for sure if it was that, because as I mentioned, I was on a parasite protocol. But those were the things that I knew for sure were diatomaceous earth because it was the only thing I'd introduced. And then those cert- things start to happen. Yeah. So I have a girl that comes to my house to do my nails. And she said that she used to be a fishmonger before she started doing nails, wow. which is a really strange job. Like if you met her, you'd be like, what? You're a fishmonger? But anyway, what that was is she literally would go and she would, when they caught the fish right then, she would cut the fish and, you know, cut it in half and turn it into fillets right there while they caught it. And she said to me, we were talking because one day I was sitting there and getting my nails done and my husband had brought home some raw, some sushi for me wrapped in cucumber and I had raw tuna. And then she, I said, would you like one? She was like, oh, no. I won't ever eat raw tuna again. And she's like, I won't even eat fish again. She said, I used to be yeah. a fishmonger. She said, when we got those fish, she said nine out of every 10 fish had parasites in them. You could actually physically see them. And our job was to just cut around it. And so that was just the fish we could see. She's like, there's no chance I'd ever eat fish again yeah. because of that. And she's like, I'm not joking you. Nine out of n nine out of 10, she's like, you could physically see. And we just had to cut through that. And I was like, oh my yeah. goodness. So is that the reason why you don't eat any raw tuna? I don't, I, yeah, I don't eat fish anymore. I mean, there's also the heavy metal bit to it too. But I know from my beef tartare days and my sushi days that that's where the tapeworm came. Or maybe it was the pork from the luau. Who knows? But those are the meats. Those are the things that, yes, harbor the most parasites for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and one more thing I might should, I might mention. So after I send the kids off to school, I come back. I walk the dog. Right now, that's the only time I have for exercise. So it's walking him. Uh, and then I come back and I jump in the shower and I do a cold shower. I don't have a cold plunge. I'd love to get one. I don't have that yet. So that's my next best thing. So I just jump in the shower. I put it on the coldest possible, and I just try to do it as long as I can. And then I just have noticed more energy. I've noticed um, more wakefulness, a bit more. When I say energy, I'm more happy energy. There's just a little bit more pep to my step. It feels like I'm refreshed. It wakes up my brain cells, it feels like. And uh, sometimes in the middle of the day, I'll do it. I'll just jump in the shower. I wish I had a cold plunge to just kind of plunge in and plunge out. But right now, the shower does the trick. Let me tell you a hack that you can do for that because we have a really big bathtub. And my husband, what he does is we have like two big ice machines at our house. 
he just takes the ice and puts it in like um, grocery bags, like plastic grocery bags, puts it in a bag. And then he also fills up Ziploc bags and puts like our uh, water in there and then just seals it up and freezes it. And then he'll put like three to four ice um, ice bags in the bath. And then you don't, it's just super easy. He just fills up the bath. He does it in the yeah. and boom. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great idea. Um, yeah. I just don't have time right now with my little three-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> also, you yeah. want me a dealman in there. <laughs> and that take face jelly. <laughs> yeah. And then I've decided to practice what I preach and have a better work-life balance. So now I stop working at um, my Eastern time here, 2.45, 3 o'clock, so that I could actually go pick up my kids from school and actually enjoy them, take them to wherever activities we want to go. Uh, so I've stopped working evenings and weekends. I just think that they deserve me right now. So yeah, that's pretty much my day. And then for uh, meals, we do not eat gluten here, 100%. Don't touch the stuff. Never cheat. Like it's not limited. It is an absolute no in our house. Um, the kids know it too. My six-year-old will like go to, he'll be offered something and he'll immediately, is this gluten-free? So they're trained pretty well. Um, I, and then when my three-year-old finds out it's gluten-free, mommy, it's gluten-free. It's so excited when he finds out something's gluten-free. Um, I try to eat paleo. I try to eat grain-free rather as much as I can. Uh, and then I listen to my body when I need a little bit of grain. And if I do eat grain, then I soak them. They're soaked 24 hours and I pressure cook them in my instant pot uh, for the kids as well. So that's the only form of grains that we eat. I don't eat very many legumes. Um, we just don't do well on legumes, whether it's a lectin sensitivity, whether it's microbes from Costa Rica. I'm not sure, but we right, uh, legumes just aren't sitting well. Um, I mean, any like yeah. I tend right. to find it is a thing. So it is a thing for most people who have gut issues. So I feel that the people like myself who have had a long history of gut issues, so chronic use of antibiotics and medications and you do something to your gut when it's so young. Uh, I don't know if this stat is correct, but I had a mentor once tell me that your microbiome is developed up until the age of seven. And then after seven, forget it. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't throw in probiotics unless you're taking them every single day. You can't reseed it. It is done. I'm not sure if I believe that or not, but regardless, it still brings up the point that what if he's, what if that, that's correct? And this is why I'm seeing this trend. People who have gut issues they keep having to manage the gut issues, meaning they're better, like myself, we're good, we're better, but we could never go back to that kind of life of gluten and legumes and eating lots of grains. And that is just not what we're designed for. That could be our genetics, it could be our cultural background, it could be um, just, just how, like I said, our design. And that's why, and we've talked about this, there's just not one diet for everyone. And it's also just not one diet for you right now forever. I find diets evolve. It depends on what stage you're at, what you're working on, what you're doing, your stress level, your genetics. There's just so many factors that come into play. On top of, I'm French Canadian. I don't have coconuts in my backyard. So why do I think that I can go ahead, crack a coconut, eat a coconut and feel good on a coconut? Like that doesn't genetically make sense, culturally make sense. So I think this like idea of who's right, who's wrong, we're always going to be in debate with regards to diet. So I just taught my kids how to listen to their bodies. One of them can't have potatoes. One can't have tomatoes. They've gotten really good at just knowing what they can eat. One week, one kid likes this. The next week, he doesn't like it. And there's a reason for that. And we just follow those cues. So that's my life. <laughs> yeah. What about dairy? Do you eat dairy or no, don't? No, no, I don't eat dairy. No, I don't. I um. Especially here, we we uh, have the pasteurized milk here. I don't trust the cows, the hormones, the antibiotics. So definitely not. No dairy. I've entertained the idea of unpasteurized milk. But again, having these gut sensitivities, I just don't think that it goes very well. And, and I've tried it. It doesn't make me feel good. Can I have cheese and ice cream here and there? Yep. It doesn't hurt me. Can I continue doing that? No, it doesn't doesn't suit me. It doesn't suit my design. Yeah, makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Okay, so let's get right back into the coffee animal. We started with, let's just do a recap. So first of all, we were talking about 
that you want to make sure that you have the stainless steel pot, a four quart pot. You want to have about four cups of make sure it's either distilled or purified water. It's super important to have really good water. And we talked about the coffee. So let's just recap for people uh, so that we can just start from the beginning of what to do for the coffee enema. But also we want to talk about how often to do this coffee enema as well. Right. Okay. So step one is we're preparing the coffee. So that's that boiling of the coffee in that stainless steel pot in four cups of water. So you're boiling that for five minutes to pull out those palmitic acids. And then you're letting it simmer for about 12 to 18 minutes. And then once that's done, you put the lid on and you let it cool. Um, It's better to do a coffee enema fresh. So you use that liquid. You wait till it's cooled down. You can pour it in a mason jar, cool it and make it cool down a lot faster. Um, But never, ever, ever uh, insert a hot coffee enema. My trick is pretend you're testing a baby bottle. You put it on your wrist. It's such a thin skin. You'll know exactly if it's too hot. For your rectum. So you test it. If it's still too hot, it's not ready. Um, and then I really think this step is important. A lot of people skip this step. It's the cheesecloth step. So when you're pouring the coffee liquid into the mason jar, I, I do this. I have my cheesecloth ready to go and I'm pouring it not when it's cooled down. I'm pouring it while it's still hot so that the palmitic acid is still easy to move. And then once it's in the cheesecloth, I'll, I'll take a break and I'll just like really squeeze that cheesecloth to make sure I'm getting all that palmitic acid. And then I'll do it again. And then I'll just keep squeezing that cheesecloth. So a lot of people skip that step. I wouldn't. It really helps with moving and getting more palmitic acid in there. Um, and then once you have that mason jar, it's ready to go. Now it's cooled off. Uh, you take that along with your castor oil and a... Um, hot water bottle pack or some kind of heat pack and then you go to the washroom I have a bath mat that I bought specifically for that I actually have a container that's my coffee enema bucket and so I have my bath mat I have all my equipment I need I bought a large strainer that fits over the toilet bowl so you put the toilet seat on top so when you're releasing the enema you can catch some really fun stuff and see what's coming out a lot of people don't like that. Uh, well, <laughs> where do you, do you buy that on Amazon? No, no, I got mine at the grocery store. Like as soon as I walked by it, both and my husband went, whoa, that's perfect for the toilet. <laughs> wait, wait, hold on. <laughs> what is it again? It's just it's like a strainer, it's- like the large, it's just like a, you know, when you would like strain vegetables, like that's what it's for. Like you're straining uh, or it's just the size meal. of it is a good. It's larger so the- that it fits on the bowl on the seat. So then, then you can put the toilet another seat the bowl then you can put the seat on top and then you're catching stuff that way otherwise the only other way is you take a plastic fork and a glove and you're fishing through the toilet bowl which i just found a lot messier Mm, that's a good idea yeah um so yes you take that i have everything in there and i have the like i said the casserole is important and then um the bucket so there's different buckets you could buy there's the stainless steel there's the plastic there's the bag uh, just by default, I ended up with the S.A. Wilson's plastic bucket. I don't suggest plastic, but my logic there, I'm always critically thinking, like instead of just always shaming people's techniques, it's just as long as you don't put hot coffee in it, it literally, you're ready to go, you pour it in and out it comes. There's not that much leaking from the plastic. But if you can't get a stainless steel, that would be better. The only thing about the stainless steel is you can't see. That's why I defaulted to that bucket. You can't see the liquid coming down. So as long as the tube is clear and you can see that you're now ending, like it's finishing, you're finishing it off, that you can then clamp it. So let me back it up. So now you're in the washroom. You've got your bucket. You've got your mason jar. You're on your right side because you want to put pressure on your liver gallbladder. That's the side. And then your when you're ready to go, you've got your castor oil, your heat pack, and you put your bucket on the counter or you hang it on a doorknob. Um the higher the bucket, the faster the enema is going to flow. So if you're finding it hard, you can't seem to get, you know, more than 200 mils in, just maybe try slowing down the speed next time. It just might be going in too fast for you. Um, So you put it on, I usually put on the counter. Some people put on the toilet. And now when you're ready to go, you put the mason jar, the liquid in the bucket, and then you unclamp it. I like to give my mason jar a shake because I want to get all of that palmitic acid uh, mixed up. I pour it in, I unclamp it, and you just let it go. 
I also have a tube that I buy. It's a red catheter tip. I find it works better. It's smaller. It's um, softer. And it's easier to clean because then you just pull it off of the actual um, bucket catheter and you can just wash the tip that way. So it's this little red tip and I attach it. <clears throat> so when you're ready to go, you're putting it about this much inside the rectum. You'll know if it's not in far enough, if you're feeling a cold sensation when you turn the coffee on. Like if you feel, oh, is it fall coming out? If you feel that, the nerve endings are still being stimulated from the liquid, put it up a little higher. So um, then you're turning it on, you're letting it drip. You've got about a liter in there. So you want to fill yourself up with that full liter. But honestly, some people can't. Some people can only do 500 milliliters. Some people can only do 200 milliliters. There's no right or wrong way. You just do what you can. And then whatever volume you fall on, you clamp it and you put it away. And now you've got to hold it. And then that's the enema retention. You're holding it for as long as you can to a max of about 15 minutes. Um, and essentially, the idea behind that is the liver goes through a cleaning cycle of about every three minutes. So if you can do it for 15 minutes, that's five cycles. And so there's no need to go any farther than 15 minutes. You guys, if you've been listening to my podcast, you know I've been talking about Masszymes, which is a digestive enzyme from Bioptimizers. And I want you to know that here's the thing. For me, having a digestive enzyme is a game changer because one of the biggest things that happens to me is I get really tired after my meal if I don't do it. And I have a problem with nutrient absorption. So if you could be eating the cleanest diet ever, but if you're not absorbing it, that's an issue. So this month they're doing a really great special and you're gonna get a free bottle of the digestive enzymes from my optimizers. And so all you have to do is pay a nominal shipping fee. That's it, no other strings attached. It's the best thing ever. So get your free bottle of digestive enzymes. It's called Masszymes. Go to masszymes.com slash wasteaway free and use the coupon code wasteaway10. That's it. So masszymes.com slash wasteaway free. Use the coupon wasteaway10. It's awesome. I wanted to ask you one thing because I read in the document, and you guys make sure that you go to the website and you can send an email and you can get a copy of this document, but you had put something about, I remember reading that your blood is cleaned every two minutes, two to three minutes that can, that you can hold the enema, which is equivalent yeah. to how long it takes to circulate blood in your, your yeah. body. So if before you take the enema, you should have first, like, let's say in the morning, you have a bowel movement in the morning, then you should do the enema because yeah. if you, that's what I wanted you to kind of talk about. Yeah. You're, no, like, yeah. You're this is kind of like something I've figured out on my own. I could be wrong, but it just makes sense to me. Like I like to, like I said, I like to think about things because there's not a lot of research around this. There's, there are a lot of people doing it, but we're all going based on the same protocol. And so this to me didn't make sense. If you want to have a bowel movement, and now you're basking your stool for 15 minutes in this coffee. Well, naturally, what does your large intestine do? It reabsorbs things back in. So the last thing I wanted is to start shooting out toxins from the liver into this, uh, into my intestines and letting it sit there and then risk it being absorbed back in. So I just felt that it was important to have the bowel movement first. If you can't have a bowel movement, if you're just not somebody who can poop early in the morning, then do a, I call it a purge enema. So whether it's with water, whether it's with like one tablespoon of coffee, whether with the full coffee, but you're just holding it for like one to three minutes, just to say you're getting all of that poop out so that you kind of cleaned yourself out. Then right after, put the actual enema in for 15 minutes and you're holding that one for 15 minutes. That's how I felt. And then once you've done that a few times, so let's say you've got constipation, so you can't poop. And so once you've done that a few times, let's say three days in a row, so you've done the purge and then your enema, next day, purge, enema, purge, enema. Well, that fourth day, if you still want to do one, it's not necessary to do another purge enema because you've now been doing these enemas every day. You're fine to just go ahead and do that enema. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. And so what I'm hearing you say, because just so you know, remember when I told you that I found that 
parasite out of me that it was it looked like it for him like six inches or so. It was actually the day after I did the enema, which was weird because but again, like I didn't I just kind of looked in the toilet after I did the enema, but like you know, I didn't like take a glove and start doing that. So I think I need to get that basket, like you said, the strainer. Yeah. So you're basically saying a strainer that's about that big. Yeah. And then you just sit it on the toilet and kind of hold it there while yeah. so it catches everything. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um what I want to say about a tapeworm. So for me, I didn't even notice I had the tapeworm. At the time I didn't have a strainer. But something, I felt it. I didn't see it. I felt it. So when I looked in the toilet, I didn't see anything. But because I had the fork and I was already prepping my husband to look through, it's only then that I, I, I kind of pulled up a whole bunch of toilet paper and then realized there's something massive in here. So like it was it was so heavy and it sunk all the way to the bottom of the toilet and like into the hole is gone. And then when I flushed, it came coming all the way back up and then I saw it again and then that's how we grabbed it. So I think the strainer is a good idea because you're probably missing a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay. And then to your point about, so I had a question for you. Did Were you taking any herbs like Alimax or oregano or something? Yeah, I've I've been doing so many different parasite cleanses, honestly. Yeah. I've okay. done some cell core ones. I've just been kind of constantly... Um, Are you doing the uh, mimosica, uh, mimosa pudica? I haven't, but I haven't. Yeah. Asked, but okay. is that that's a really good one? Yeah, I really like that one. I see that one really do do what you just explained, which is later on you're seeing the parasites come out, the worms come out, the things come out afterwards. Uh, I see it also with Alimax. I see it a lot with that garlic supplement we talked about as well, because those are very dehydrating as well. And biofilm, as we talked about before, can really block the release of a lot of these parasites. So when you start breaking up biofilm, uh, eventually you're thinking you're done. And then next thing you know, you have this outbreak because a biofilm just cracked open and now those contents just came out. And, you know, it's arguable that what you're seeing is intestinal lining. It's maybe not parasite, but regardless, it's this dysbiosis, this dysfunction in the large intestine that is causing this accumulation of biofilm and tissue and it needs to come out. It just needs to come out. <laughs> right. Like she said to me, cause I told her about it. She's like, are you sure that you just didn't eat like spaghetti or something? And yeah, I, yeah. Guess it. I was like, first of all, you know, I don't eat spaghetti. I don't eat gluten and I don't eat. Pasta. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. I have so many pictures on my phone. I keep an album when patients send me stuff. Because it's just mind blowing. This is mind blowing. I always remember this one case. Um, let's talk about timing because it falls into the story. <laughs> so, the timing of how many you should or how often you should do them and all that. So, the Gerson Therapy Institute that that's where they treat cancer. They'll they're doing them every day and they're doing them multiple times a day and they're doing it like every two hours. Uh, and they've got this whole protocol with that. So, if that's not you and you're not being followed by professionals for that. Then my recommendation to a lot of patients is I mean, just do one, see how it goes. And if you can handle it, do at least two more. So at least three in a row, just to get some momentum and get some stuff out. And if you can continue daily and that feels good, it's actually benefiting you, then yeah, I would keep going every day um, at a max of six weeks. But to be honest, I don't see many people hit that six week mark. I see them hit more like a two week, three week by the time their bodies have had enough and you need a break. And as I mentioned before, you'll know, you'll know you need a break. You just don't want to do it. You're excited to do them, excited to do them. You're excited to do them because you feel so good. And then you just don't want to do them anymore. And that's your body saying, just give me a break. Um, so this one particular woman, I'd said this recommendation she was seeing. To this day, I still haven't seen this level of worms ever. The entire strainer, it was like as if she was straining spaghetti. And every single time she had an enema, she was having these strainers of spaghetti every single day, along with a bunch of other things, too. And the first time I thought it was a, just a coincidence, second time, third time, fourth time. And it was just weeks. She had hit three weeks still having these strainers of worms. And she was really unwell. And for her, she kept pushing through because for her, she wanted those out. So she continued on over to the six weeks. And then after that, you can go into maintenance. So I have people on a full moon protocol. So then they do herbs, 
oregano, garlic or whatnot. Uh, cell core, I think, has even I, a patient told me they have like a full moon protocol, I think, to a kit. You do that around the full moon. You do the enemas with that. And that's your maintenance for a little while. And the full moon is because parasites are more active <clears throat> around that time. Other people, I have them do it like once a week. Uh, other people, it's every three months. It really just depends at what stage you're at. Once you start feeling good, you just then do them as needed. You just kind of like decide. Now, I have other people who talk about still doing them a couple of times a week because they just like how it makes them feel. They have more brain energy. They have more physical energy. They just feel better. And that could be because of the level of toxicity they're burdened by, like depending on your genetics, depending on what you're exposed to on a daily basis. If you're a painter and you're painting, that's your job, then you're going to be exposed to more chemicals. You may want to do them weekly. So that's the, the frequency really depends. And you should talk to your practitioner about it and decide what works best for you. And then also trust your gut, literally. <laughs> so kind of what I've heard you say is, and I'll put all of these in the show notes, um, with links, uh, like for the Amazon links and different links, any that you give me, but kind of the things that really work the best are either Alimac, Oregano, Mimosa, Pudica, NAC, and Serapeptase. Is there anything else, yeah. like, would you, would you say like, would someone be taking all of them or would they like, what does that look like? Would they, you know, take, yeah. like if they were in a bad shape, let's say they were kind of like me, you would say, all right, you're going to take seven Alimac and two or like, what, what would you recommend that what they do some and kind of change off or do all of them? It's a good question. It's so hard to answer because everybody shows up at different stages. Um, because if you have low stomach acid and I tell you to take all of these pills, you might feel nauseous and not be able to do all of that. So then we pivot and then we've got to get you on something like um, mastica gum or uh, licorice root, things that actually help with lining. To Maybe there's irritations and you're not able to get these supplements down. Uh, maybe we do just some liver support like NAC, schizandra, milk thistle, those sort of things to support the liver to then move some bile. Tudka is one of my favorites to move bile as well, orally. But again, because a lot of people with gut issues have a hard time taking things in, the coffee enema sometimes need to be started first to just start moving that bile to get that stomach acid level up to then be able to digest supplements. So kind of a tough answer. And some people, when they take Tudka, they don't feel great either. Like there's mm -hmm. Right. Like, a few yeah, days. because they're stuck. And this is why I think it's because they're the bile ducts are stuck. There's no movement because it's stuck with bi biofilms. And this is why when you do coffee enemas, we're seeing all of these things because it creates a bit of a pressure on the gallbladder and it's forcing it to squeeze out. A lot of people will even talk about the gallbladder swoosh as you're laying there because you're just all of a sudden like whoosh, like moving all of this stuff out of the gallbladder. Um, and then when you do that, the bile ducts get freed up. So as you're building your bile acid with Tudka and all these amazing things, sometimes you're just stuck and it won't come out. So you feel worse because now you've got this buildup and no release. Sure. Makes sense. Makes mm -hmm. sense. So I think the most powerful thing that like I've never heard anyone say is just how often you feel like you could do these coffee enemas. Now, is there any like cons? Like if you said like, you know, you're you're doing it too much or any chance of like infection if they didn't, like what are some of the cons that people need to be worried about? Yeah, that's a good, great question. Um, let's talk about maybe conditions first. Like if you do have cancer and you're in like a very severe stage, like you don't want to be doing these on your own. Like you want to be monitored. There's too many toxins. If you're looking at chemotherapy, you don't want all that dumped into your colon. You need to be properly supported. So I personally won't take cancer patients. I would prefer them to uh, actually go to a Gerson Institute or be followed by a therapist that way or somebody who's experienced in cancer. Um, and I have, I have had persons who have been in remission of cancer and as long as everything's okay and uh they're settled they're they're completely in remission then I'll, that's fine but i've i've told people who have crohn's colitis or are in a flare to not do an enema only because there's already irritation and inflammation and it's not the coffee enema that will hurt them it's more so the influx of toxins so i'd rather work on the body first and support 
support the system before going and aggressively moving things out. So I would caution people who do have a colitis of some sort. Um, children, I know a lot of practitioners, I haven't done them on children. I know a lot of practitioners who do use them for autism and it's worked well. So again, that needs to be a practitioner. Uh, that's an invasive procedure. And I always caution parents, like, you don't want to do something like that to your child, like especially a child who's not coherent. Like you want to make sure that this is something that needs to happen. And it's with a practitioner that can help. Um, I've heard of vets who are using them on animals. Um, again, not something you want to do at home on your own pet. You want to have a these, there's practice. There are practitioners who actually do these and there's clinics. So um, I would say that the person who wants to do them at home, um, they're feeling relatively OK, meaning they're not in a dangerous diagnosis. That's really what I'm talking about. Like you need to you want a professional to help you. So somebody like yourself, you might have gas, bloating, your fatigue, you're tired. Um, you know, you're in a hormonal imbalance. Perhaps you're not sleeping well. Like th those are all things that would really benefit from a coffee enema. What you want to watch for is the tip. The things that have hurt people in the past where all the research, the dangerous research comes in is a sharp tip that pierced the colon. So common sense, make sure the tip is soft and rounded and we're not putting anything in there that's sharp. Second things that have come up are burns. So again, common sense, you're not using hot coffee. We're measuring it on our wrist, the really, a really thin tissue to make sure it's the right temperature. Um, fasting, people have also been injured in the research or women Two particular, two women in particular who fasted and not intermittent fasting. I mean, fasting, like not eating anything, I believe for weeks from what I read. Um, and the enemas really can deplete you of your electrolytes and your minerals. So when you're not eating and not properly supplementing and you're doing multiple enemas in a day, that is, is a recipe for disaster. So that's where people are getting this dangerous um, idea about enemas. Um, so you do want to rehydrate yourself. You want to make sure you're drinking enough water. You want to make sure there's electrolytes to your day, particularly per potassium. Potassium is the most important one. Uh, and minerals, because again, you're losing these minerals. Um, Let me ask and you about, you know, so I'm, we have a place called Edgar Casey, And I think, I think if, you, if you're listening to this, we have exciting news. Dr. Crystal is going to come down to Virginia Beach and we're going <laughs> to actually, we're going to film doing a uh, coffee <laughs> enema. So you're going to get to see this live. So if you want a copy of that, let us know. And we are really excited to do that. But I want to, one of the things that I've been doing is I've been going to the Edgar Casey and doing what they call either, some people call it a colonic, some people call it colon hydrotherapy. And basically what it is, it's like um, kind of like an enema, but they have they just take warm water, filtered water, and then they they put it in and then they only keep it in for a, a shorter amount of time. And then they kind of push it out. Um, they kind of like suction it out. So, But it's pressurized too, right? Isn't it like, yeah. like a, yeah, pressurized. Yeah, it's and it's a lot nice. more water. Isn't it like 16 liters of water or something like that? Yeah, it's, it's a lot of water for yeah. sure. And then they yeah. put it in, but they... It's about a 45 minute procedure and they basically um, they have you do it. And I've done several of them and I feel like a million bucks after I do it for like at least two days after I do it. it it's so good. But it basically is they have water temperature and the pressure is closely monitored and it regulates and there's a they do a series of fills. So they fill the water and then it they it just aids in the peristaltic action of the colon um and they just put like a hospital gown on you and then you like m move to the side and then they just pour the water or you know the, the machine uh puts the water in and then it just kind of pressurizes it out so what's your opinion on that or versus um doing an enema enema to me they're completely different so their intentions are different um, meaning the hydro, the colon irrigation to me is to clear you out, is to move things out. And usually that's somebody who's not able to do that on their own. But then to that, I question, why does that make you feel so good? And why can't you move that out on your own? There's always a root cause to that. Our bodies are designed to do that on its own. So again, these to me are crutches because 
we're relying on something to get all of this stuff out of us. I don't see coffee enemas that way. I see coffee enemas addressing more of the root because the enemas are addressing the the issue with the bile ducts, the bile acid and the liver particularly. And so what it's doing is it's moving that bile acid into the small intestine to break up your fat so that you can use your fat to make your hormones, your vitamins that are fat soluble and break down your cholesterol. So like for me, it's a getting to the root cause, which is why you need the enemas less and less and less, because now you've addressed the actual issue. Whereas the colon irrigation, it's a great crutch in the beginning to like get your get you cleaned out. You're moving things, you're just little blitzes here and there until you figure it out what's going on. Um, I've often recommended to people do the irrigation first, clear you out, and then start your enemas. That I find works really well, that process. Uh, but I wouldn't do both at the same time. The enemas, the coffee enemas are quite capable of helping you. Uh, they're cheaper, in my opinion, and they're just doing more. They're actually addressing the problem, which is the liver gallbladder. Mm. Yeah, because this is not cheap. I mean, it's not <laughs> really, really expensive. No. Yeah. And they have their function. They have their use. But I I would say, like, like I said, as a crutch. And then you start with that and then you end with the enemas. I love it. Well, this has been amazing. Tell listeners where they can find you and where they can follow you. Okay. Um, you can follow me on TikTok. I have a lot of videos on TikTok about um, gut infections and the roots of what all of this could be. Parasites, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, how if you have IBS, you've been lied to, and it's not just IBS and you stop there. You need to investigate further as to what the irritation is in your gut, what is causing the IBS. There's a lot of videos on there. Um, the handle for that is Dr. Crystal N D. So it's D-R and then Crystal C H R I S T A L N D. And that's the And as in Nancy as well. And as in Nancy or a naturopathic doctor. Yep. And then that same handle is the same for my email. So it's info at drcrystalnd.com and same for my website, uh, drcrystalnd.com. Um, so that's where you can find me. And then uh, in a few weeks, I'm actually filming a documentary and we're going to be doing Coffee Enema as well on this documentary. We're going to be talking about that and that will be coming out in 2024. Um, so I will keep you up to date on that when all of that comes out as well. Um, and if you uh, see me on Instagram, I'm going to be starting to post a lot more on Instagram and um, putting a lot more Coffee Enema tidbits on there and pictures probably going to have a little highlight reel with all the pictures all the yummy pictures of poop that people are going to get shocked by <laughs> so if you follow me on there stay tuned for that that's coming up and yeah this has been fun Chantal. I mean, there's, I, we've got yeah. all day there's so much to talk about i know i just can't get enough and you guys definitely need to go to her website she also has another one called the banish blue blueprint so that. if you want to go to that and just yeah. Her really helping figure out, you know, that getting rid of the gut infection in, is what's going to help you with the digestion, the hormonal imbalances, mental health. I agree. I think that a lot of people who are struggling with mental health issues, it's the it's a big thing for the parasites and all the different gut infections that you have. You know, one thing we didn't talk about that we really should have is just real quickly, I want you to to touch on SIBO, because I believe that honestly, more and more people do have SIBO. So I want you to just quickly talk about that. How would you know if you had SIBO and what are some of the, what what would your poop look like if, if you had that? Mm. So yeah, SIBO is much more common than we think. It is, uh, there was a paper that came out looking at people diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome. And the stat was really high, something along the lines of 77 to 80 percent of the people diagnosed with IBS actually found to were actually found to have SIBO. So the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and that's because it's an irritant. It's a bacterial overgrowth. Now, it doesn't mean that every IBS person has that, but a lot of them do alongside parasites. It's another irritant, heavy metals, chemicals. So SIBO is basically a term to describe that your microbiome, your good and your bad guys, are out of balance. You're bad guys, but we call them opportunistic because they're not bad. They're just bad because there's too many of them now. And so they've grown to a number that is fermenting your food. 
So the symptoms of SIBO is really a result of those bacteria eating that food, fermenting on that food. And think about anything that ferments, wine, beer, kombucha, it creates bubbles, it creates gas. And so then you are experiencing gas pressure. That pressure can push up on the diaphragm, causing heartburn. You'll have fatigue because now you're not absorbing your nutrients. They're eating it. Uh, brain fog, again, because you can't think. You're not getting any of those amino acids. You might have constipation. You might have diarrhea. You might have a blend of both, just like the irritable bowel syndrome. You will definitely have bloating. Um, a lot of people will have bad breath. Uh, and burping is also another possible symptom. Now, you don't have to have all of that. You might have just one symptom, which could mean you have a very mild case of SIBO. And getting rid of it now is important before it continues to grow. And then that number of bacterial of bacteria that are overgrowing take over. So you don't want to wait for that. If there is an imbalance in your gut and you're seeing it now and you're living with it, Sure, you're, it's livable for now until a stressor occurs, until something health else happens and put, it's the extra straw that breaks the camel's back. And then at that point, it's a lot harder, a lot more time, a lot more money to reverse. So SIBO is very treatable. It, it's not that complicated. It's complicated only somebody also has parasites and heavy metal toxicities and a bunch of other things complicating it. But straight up SIBO is pretty manageable. So very common. I'm sure you've Probably talked to a lot of people who complain about bloating and gas and burping and we just chalk it up to food. And I'm not a practitioner that likes to blame food. I, I'm not. I feel like food is just along for the ride and it's getting blamed. Because in my protocol, when I'm seeing people, which is tr when I'm trying to do my banished bloat blueprint, because I'm seeing so many people and I'm trying to get the message out and help more people in a group program. Um, so what I'm seeing is food Certain foods like apples, like avocados, like onions, like garlic, fermentable foods will bloat you and cause you issues. So you stop that food and you feel better. But to me, that's not the answer. You have a problem with that food in the first place because of that gut dysbiosis. So once you get rid of these opportunistic guys and they stop eating that food, now you're not fermented. That food's not fermenting. So now you're not creating gas and bloat. And now when you try that food again, it's not feeding them. They're not there. So now you're not symptomatic. So until you've done a gut protocol and gotten rid of the infection, don't start eliminating all this food because it might not be the food. It might be something completely different. Mm. So good. Well, this has been amazing. You guys stay tuned. We've got another episode coming up. In just <laughs> bye bye for now. Bye.